Michael Lower from CUHK Law, and this is my presentation about consequential transitions and undergraduate legal education. And I'm drawing on the work of a, an educational theorist called King Beach, who argues that learning is often best understood as a consequential transition. And he explains that a consequential transition occurs when there's a new relationship between an individual and a social activity. In our case, we're thinking about the transition that a learner makes, a student makes, when they go from school to university, and at the same time, when they come into legal education for the first time. So the individual is the learner, and the social activity is university and legal education. Now, of course, these transitions can be difficult for students, and so we as educators can support students, try to anticipate the difficulties that they're likely to face and help them through those difficulties. And doing so begins by requiring us to understand the nature of the transition and then to think about what we can usefully do to support students so that they can make that transition. So the structure of the presentation is that first of all, I'm going to explain Beach's theory of learning as a consequential transition. And then I'm going to reflect on the practice implications the implications for teaching and learning practice and the implications for assessment practice. And that's really mostly what the presentation is going to be. But I'll close by looking at the types of transition that might be involved, because Beach points out there's more than one type of consequential transition. And each type of consequential transition has its own difficulties. So first of all, the theory of learning as a consequential transition. So I'm drawing on the, the work of this theorist, King Beach, and he wrote quite a number of articles, but I'm going to draw particularly on two articles in 1999 and 2003, and then a later book chapter, 2010 book chapter, where he reflects on the implications of his theory for assessment. So Beach's theory of learning as a consequential transition is a socio-cultural theory. That is, it's concerned with the relationship between individuals, the learner, and a social activity, university, legal education. And this relationship is recursive because not only does the social activity have an impact on the learner, but vice versa, the learner has an impact on the social activity. So let me read this quote to you. The concept of a consequential transition involves a developmental change in the relation between an individual and one or more social activities. Transitions are consequential when they are consciously, consciously reflected on, often struggled with. And the eventual outcome changes one's sense of self and social positioning. So it's developmental. It helps the student to make some progress in their lives. Um, it's got involved struggle. And so we have to try to help the students to overcome that struggle. And it's linked with identity. So it's about learning. It's about knowledge. But it's how this learning leads to a new sense of self and social positioning a new identity. So there's a changed sense of self, a change of identity, a change in how we see ourselves and how others see us. So Beach says that what partly what's involved is identity craft work. So how's this relevant to legal education? Well, our students coming from school First of all, they're making a transition to university, so from school student to university student. That is a significant transition. It's a new identity as a student, and it involves learning to live away from home, learning how universities work, forging a relationship with the university, <clears throat> and coming to see oneself 
as a university student. Then the other transition we're concerned with is the student who is new to law. So it's a transition into legal education. So the student has to work out how the law works, how to think like a lawyer, and then be able to you know, draw on that legal thinking and use legal resources to solve problems. And so to assume this new identity of law student or lawyer so these transitions are significant, they involve new identities, and uh, the questions for the university and for us as legal educators is to try to understand what makes these transitions difficult and what can we do to support students through those difficulties. So what teaching and learning practices, what assessment practices can we adopt that might assist our students in making these transitions? Within Beach's theory, uh, artifacts, the idea of artifacts plays a role. So he argues that artifacts are central to the relationship between the individual and the activity. So artifacts are things that are created in a certain sense to store knowledge and to transmit knowledge within the, within the activity. So if we think of the activity as law or legal education, the sort of artefacts that we've got, first of all, are language, so legal terminology. So we learn words like stare decisis, ratio decidendi, obita dicta, and a whole range of technical terms that, you know, um, in land law, contract law. Legal reasoning, <clears throat> so lawyers have got a characteristic way of analysing problems and then you know, trying to propose solutions. Cases, journal articles, textbooks and other teaching resources are all artefacts that bridge the relationship between the individual and the social activity. So Beach talks about this central role that artefacts play in consequential transitions, in learning. So he says this, that you see on the slide, knowledge propagation and systems of artefacts weave together changing individuals and social organisations in such a way that the person experiences becoming someone or something new. Now, one thing I want to say about this is that the individual coming to the social activity can play a creative role, can think of new ways of using artefacts, or can create new artefacts, so they can contribute to knowledge and culture. One last quote about the theory of consequential transition, and hopefully by now it, it makes sense to you. Beach says, a consequential transition is the conscious reflective struggle to propagate knowledge linked with identity in ways that are consequential to the individual becoming someone or something new, and in ways that contribute to sociogenesis, the creation and metamorphosis of social activity, and ultimately society producing culture in addition to reproducing it. So students, as, as I said in the last slide, Students might find new ways of using artefacts or might create artefacts of their own. And that would be an example of producing culture. That's all I want to say about the theory. The next part of my talk is about the practice implications of this theory. So Crafter and Maunder talk about the importance of collaboration, mentoring and social relationships to support consequential transitions. So I'll just read this quote to you, that education for consequential transitions prioritises the development of relationships for learners. Undertaking educational transition by providing lots of opportunity for social networking, ongoing collaborative activity, 
and helping to nurture relationships between new and existing members of the learning community, either through informal or more formal means, such as mentoring and buddying. So it's definitely a good idea to try to get students to work in collaborative groups as often as possible, so that they can teach each other and support each other when they face difficulties. It's also a good idea to get older students, perhaps PhD students, or even young professionals to act as tutors, mentors, or buddies for younger students, again, to support them in their learning as they try to make these consequential transitions. Uh, and these, these older students or young professionals are ideal bridges, I ideal supports, because they've recently gone through that transition themselves, so they know what's involved. And also, they can act as a role model for those younger students who are trying to make this transition. Engel talks about the importance of framing, excuse me, framing student work as a contribution to public knowledge. And this framing has two elements, framing in terms of time and framing in terms of participation. So Engel says that learners come to understand that what they're currently doing is part of a larger intellectual conversation that extends across time. So they locate their work in the ongoing inquiry that takes place within law and legal scholarship. And framing participation, so framing students as learners who are engaged with a broad community of people, actively engaged in, in intellectual conversation with them. So, so, they, so students come to see themselves as in some way, creating knowledge, engaging in intellectual conversation, not only with current students, but perhaps also with uh, the general public or with practicing lawyers or with legal scholars. So we can, for instance, try to organize student conferences so that students can present their work. <clears throat> we can encourage students to produce artifacts such as articles, blog posts, or videos that would help them to, that would frame their work as being of interest to this broader community. In his 2010 uh, chapter, book chapter, Beach thinks about the implications of his theory for assessment. And we see here that he says that educational assessment for the 21st century needs to accept the challenge of assessing relations between persons and domains, persons and social activities, through a focus on appreciative systems. Now, an appreciative system is the domain, the social activities, goals, customs and values, how it decides whether some work is a good piece of work. So the idea is that we want, need to help law students to understand the goals, customs and values of legal scholarship, and legal practice, and assessment should be geared to achieving that. G, in the same book, talks about the usefulness of authentic assessments. So these are assessments that tell us whether learners faced with a complex problem know how to go on, how to probe, reflect, assess and reprobe on a traje traje trajectory of action to a goal. So this would see law students learning how to make use of legal resources and criteria of good legal res research, scholarship, problem solving, to solve the sort of problem that lawyers have to solve. So that an assessment is seeing whether students can do that, can problem solve in the way that professional lawyers problem solve. G talks about assessment as a way of, of helping students to learn how to dance with the group's technology. So to use the knowledge tools, the artifacts of law to aid problem solving. G also has this idea of pro and communities as a way of thinking about useful forms of teaching and learning activity and assessment. So a pro-am, professional amateur, 
what he has in mind is groups of enthusiastic amateurs, perhaps groups of amateur historians or scientists who bring passion for a subject and some you know, quite serious knowledge, but not professional knowledge to, the, to, 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 the, to, to some subject. And then perhaps they collaborate, maybe in online groups, to discuss problems. And so thinking about what that means for our teaching and learning assessment might make us think about, for example, setting up blogs about our subject that students can contribute to, so they can publish on these blogs and they can critique each other's work in these blogs. So just summing up some of the ideas, the possible practice implications of Beach's theory. So we might want to engage students in real research projects and then make, make their findings known through articles or blog posts so that we're framing their work as a contribution to the intellectual community. When we're asking students to deal with the typical kind of problem question that they face in tutorials or exams, we might tweak it somewhat by asking them to not to tell us about the answer, but to provide an email or letter of advice to a client. So again, framing it as, as, as knowledge that's of interest to a fictitious community, a fictitious audience. We've seen the importance of collaboration so that students support each other and also perhaps get the support of older students or young professionals through mentoring. And then I just talked about the idea of setting up blogs, <clears throat> both as a way of engaging, helping students to think that they're contributing to the knowledge of some broader community, but um, also as a way of setting up these pro-am communities. And that's mostly what I want to say. The, the final idea is that Beach points out that there's more than one type of consequential transition. So this is his typology of consequential transitions. And the first type in the top left is lateral transitions, which occur when an individual moves between two historically related activities in a single direction. So school to university, and then later university to workplace. And that's the sort of transition we had, we've had, we had in mind uh, in this presentation. So undergraduate students going from school to university. But let's look at collateral transition in the top right. So Beach says this involves individuals relatively simultaneous participation in two or more historically related activities. So he gives the example of, let's say, full-time study, but where the student is also maybe working in a fast food joint. Uh, you know, fast food outlet to support his study. And so he says that that has got difficulties of its own that we need to bear in mind, but also has potential benefits that students might work, learn certain things, maybe time, discipline or whatever, that will help them in their university study. And another example of a collateral transition that we might come across is full-time students engaged in part-time study. And that, that is another example of a collateral transition. Uh, and again, you can see that the challenges that face that type of student and what that type of student brings to study might be different to the lateral transition of a school student going into university. So we need to think about how to support that type of student. Then in the bottom left, we've got encompassing transitions, which occur within the boundaries of a social activity, which is itself changing. This is relevant to us because one transition is when the student starts legal education, but there's another transition which needs to take place, and that is as they become more experienced students, capable perhaps of teaching others, you know, teaching younger students. So they, they be, they've learned how to do law well, how to do legal education well, and that's a kind of transition. Not all law students make it, uh, but we want to support that transition. Beach here says this type of transition is similar to the concept of the community of practice. Some of you might be familiar with Lave and Wenger's concept of communities of practice. 
Finally, mediational transitions. These, this is now we're thinking about the transition from law school to workplace. So these are, these, these are transitions which occur within educational activities that project or simulate involvement in an activity yet to be fully experienced. So mooting, clinical legal education, internships, these take place within legal education, but they're preparing students for the later transition into legal practice. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and your comments. This is my email address. Well, um, so thanks for listening. And I hope you can see that, that I think it is very similar to what Sadie was saying in some ways. <clears throat> We've got a, a minute for a question, if there are any questions. Hi, Sadie. Hi, hi, Michael. Thank you very much. That was um, that was really interesting. I have a quick question, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the use of artifacts as a new skill that law students need to master. So, you know, things like uh, statutory interpretation, legal research, case analysis. And I was wondering what you think is the best way to help students transition so that they're able to kind of develop and use these new skills, if you think that's through kind of one-off legal skills course, which often happens at many universities, typically in the first year, or if you think it should be embedded, the, this kind of skills development throughout throughout the degree. Well, I'd say something slightly different. So the idea of artifacts is you can't help it. Whenever you, when you, whenever you want to get involved in some new activity, then it's going to be, there are going to be some artifacts. You're going to have to learn the language, learn the lingo of that activity. So in other words, I think that, that in, what I would put say differently is that teaching our students the lingo, the art that is the artifact, it, it, well, we're doing it all the time, for, for better or worse. Uh, and similarly, and then we draw on other artifacts. So artifacts are like stores of knowledge, tools for, for, for new people to learn about a, a thing. But the different thing about Beach is he's saying that it, it, it's two way. So all right, we learn the lingo, we learn how to read a case, etc. But it, what he's saying that's interesting is that it's not one way traffic. That equally, we might find new, and partly it's that's going to be based on what else we're doing at the time. That would, might give us a different way of looking at it. So that goes to that final slide about types. So other things we're doing at the time that we bring to, that we bring with us into the new activity. And with that might give us the capacity to creatively think of new artifacts or new uses of existing artifacts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. There's a good thing about consequential transitions in the news, in the English news, uh, is that um, there was the, these guys have just been arrested. I don't know if you saw it, uh, because they were running a criminal gang, a drug cartel. But they were training, the, the, when people were joining, they were being taught chemistry. They were being so, sent to chemistry school uh, to, to learn chemistry so that they could make better drugs, a bit like um, Breaking Bad. But that, you know, that's kind of a trend, because they're learning the language of chemistry so that they could get on in this new world of so it's bringing chemistry together with drug dealing, you know, and so that's differently, that's different from chemistry with something else. Yeah, anyway, I just, yeah. Thanks, Chris, Thank Sadie. Thank you very much. Well, I think that, that we really uh, we need to move on to the final presentation, which again is recorded by Professor Stuart Hargreaves about humanizing the law, using micro modules to teach LGBT rights jurisprudence. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Stuart Hargreaves. Um, I apologize I can't be there in, in person today, but um, I'm in Canada at the moment. Uh, and so this recording will, will have to suffice due to the um, 
time zone difference. So I'm going to present to you today about a project um, called Humanizing the Law. Um, and this uh, project aimed to kind of connect students with not only uh, legal principles in a series of core LGBT rights cases in Hong Kong, but with um, the underlying um, impact that these cases had on uh, the particular applicants um, in each of them. So let me explain to you uh, some of details. So I teach, um, or one of the things I teach here at CUHK Law is, is constitutional law. And uh, the co-supervisor on the project, uh, Rehan Abarate, my good colleague, um, also teaches the same course, but I usually am assigned to teach it in um, the JD, and he's usually assigned to teach it in the LLB. And so, of course, in those two courses, we both um, teach about equality rights. And so we decided to collaborate on, on this project and allow students in both um, the JD and the LLB programs to, to benefit from um, what we thought would be um, a useful series of, of micro modules. So as I said, the, the core goal of the project was to enhance um, not only legal understanding on the part of our students, but also um, to sort of understand how the law impacts upon people um, in a more kind of practical day-to-day uh, -day way, rather than just memorizing um, you know, principles that come out of, of the law. So there were five micro modules created in the end, and I will show you what that looks like um, in a bit. But essentially, each of the micro modules consisted of a textual summary of, of the particular case. Um, this, so the, the legal summary written by uh, myself or by my colleague, Professor Apparatne. Mm -hmm. um, an interview with the claimant divided into, into different parts with uh, subtitles to kind of make it easier to follow, and then links to um, relevant materials, both legislation, other cases, and um, some contemporary media as well. Again, I'll show you what that looks like uh, shortly. So the grant uh, we applied for was from the CUHK Courseware Development Scheme. Uh, we're very grateful for that assistance. Um, the primary cost was to hire um, AV technicians to help us with you know, lighting and good recording and editing and to, to subtitle the videos and so on. But we also hired a research assistant um, to assist us with kind of the back and forth basic administration once we were in contact with um, some of the parties who we interviewed. And she also helped us uh, generate the initial transcripts um, to help uh, subtitle the videos, as I said. Um, we ended up actually not using uh, all of the money that we were, we were granted. Part of that was um, because the uh, AV people had sort of overestimated how much it would cost but part of it was also because we ended up doing uh Rehan and i ended up doing uh, two of the videos ourselves our recording two of the interviews ourselves um, and this was connected to another issue that we ran into which was the delay of the project that actually took over a year from the time we we received the grant to the time we were able to use the micro modules and courses um, so part of the reason for that was due to covid right it made it difficult to to meet people face to face um, at convenient times it, it made um, it hard to to organize when the uh, AV technicians could come um, to the, the campus in the graduate law center to help us record. But it also was a problem because the JD course and the LLB course run in two different terms. The JD course runs in term one, the LLB course runs in term two, and we needed to wait for both courses to run with these micro modules available to sort of, you know, obtain student evaluations about whether or not they were effective. How did we go about this, the mechanics of it? So Rehan and I kind of identified from our prior teaching about 10, I would say, what we thought were um, core LGBT rights cases um, in, in Hong Kong uh, over a span of about 15 or 20 years. And of course, if you look at these cases online, you can see there is a list, it's a list of record for each one. So what we did was we asked our RA to find out or to contact those solicitors if they were still in practice and pass along our requests to the parties to those cases to see if they would be interested in, in meeting with us to discuss the project and then maybe to participate um, in the project later on. We, we didn't know any of the, um, the parties ourselves directly. Uh, I think some people at first were a bit um, hesitant, understandably. This is a, a subjective, um, or so it's a, a sensitive area of law in, in Hong Kong. And uh, Rehan and I were, I think, unknown to most people in, in the community. So I think there was some um, concern about what the uh, intentions or the motivations of the project were. But once we had one person on board, I think that seemed to sort of uh, really help other people um, feel more confident about what the purposes of the project 
um, were. But in the end, you know, some people were not interested in, in participating for a range of reasons, and that was fine. Um, once we received a no, we didn't ask them um, more than more than once. So of those 10, we ended up with four expressing an interest in, in participating, and then one other um, party to a less known, a less well-known case. Um, it was not in our initial 10, um, expressed an interest in joining after they found out about, about the project. Again, showing, I think, that, that once people heard about the project, um, they realized what kind of benefits this could have um, for, for understanding of LGBT rights in, in Hong Kong. We offered to conduct all of the interviews in, in either English or Chinese. In the end, they were all um, conducted in English. And as you will see, um, when I show you an example of the videos, you'll see that uh, sometimes individuals are wearing masks. But again, this was because of, of the COVID pandemic, which was occurring at the time um, when we began recording the videos. So this is, um, you know, health reasons rather than um, identification concerns that the parties had. So the micro modules, um, what did we talk about with, with the, the claimants? Well, the interviews were kind of broad based. We we created a series of questions to ask them. Uh, Rayan and I created a list of questions to ask them at the beginning. But you know the interviews kind of went in a range of, of of different areas depending upon their responses. And what we did was we tried to edit those into um, each interview uh, into kind of four thematic chunks. So we didn't just upload the raw interview to um, to the website. Um, we did kind of cut it down into into the areas that we thought would be most useful for our students. So the four sort of chunks that each interview is condensed into um, is about the background to the case, the party's subjective feelings about, about the process itself, what was it like um, going through the court system, right? Some of the people had multi-year processes, um, appeals, losing their case and then appealing and then winning and so on. Some people didn't win in the end at all. Um, we asked them about how they felt about the outcome, right? Were they satisfied with the result that they received from the court? Did they read the case? Um, could they understand the judgment? One of the things we wanted to tease out was, you know, do, do people who are involved in these cases read, even read the outcome, right? It's very legal, technical language sometimes. Do they even read it? And then we wanted to know the, the, their general thoughts on the future of um, LGBT rights in Hong Kong, partially from a legal perspective, but mostly just from a, a social perspective, right? How did they see the, um, the, the, the society evolving, I suppose, in a way um, over the next five or 10 years, right? And some people were relatively positive, others were, were less so. Um, but anyway, it was interesting to, to see these kind of different views of people from these, these well-known cases. So after we did these videos, we edited them, we we sent kind of timestamps to the, the AV technician so they could do the editing, but Rayhan and I decided how the editing um, should go. And then with the assistance of our, 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 our RA, our research assistant, uh, we generated transcripts and sent those to the AV people, again, to add subtitles, um, I think, to make it easier for people to, to follow along. So the micro modules, then we, the five of them, we placed them on a, a dedicated um, Blackboard course website so that it could be accessed by people in, in both the LLB and the JD course and essentially in the future, in future years, rather than having to re-upload, we can simply open this dedicated course website to the current students. So it's sort of an ongoing um, plan, I suppose. It's not just a one-year um, project. So I'm going to show you a video now that shows you what this looked like. Um, this video actually I made um, for the granting agency. So if you hear me refer in this video to a final report, um, it's because I had to generate a final report to create a final report um, for the granting uh, body in the universities. Um, so some some aspects of this next video might I might repeat things I've already said to you, but nonetheless, you'll get to see what um, what it looks like. the final report for the human project. So um, again, a reminder, this was a series of five micro modules aimed at teaching um, some fundamental rights cases in two different constitutional law courses in the faculty of law. And the five cases were all aimed at uh, LGBT rights in Hong Kong. So they were based upon um, interviews uh, with claimants to those uh, fundamental cases. So this is what the uh, students would see on Blackboard um, when, when they logged in. So on the side, we can click on the list of uh, five micro modules. These are the names of the parties from each one. So I'll just click on the first one to give you an example of, of how it looks. So here we have uh, the, the case name, Lung TC, William Roy, and the Secretary of Justice. Um, that's the case citation, um, the applicant's um, 
commonly used name Billy Lung, so we can click on uh, Billy Lung. Here we have then um, a textual summary of a case of the legal principles written by um, myself, the project investigator, and uh, the co-investigator of the project. So we wrote this in kind of uh, simple language, but as you can see, put in um, a series of links um, into relevant legislation, into related cases for students to, uh, to read. And at the end of the legal summary, we added in links in both English and Chinese to contemporary um, media accounts of these cases as they were released from a variety of different um, political and ideological perspectives, sort of to give the students a sense of, of how these cases were viewed at the time. This one, as you can see, um, was from 2006. And so one of the interesting things for the students, I think, was to see how uh, media reports uh, evolved over time, right? These socially sensitive um, issues, but we can see how uh, media accounts have changed um, from 2006 to uh, 2020, which was the most recent of the cases that we looked at. But each of the five macro modules will begin with this um, same format, so a, a textual description. And then you can see here, I'm highlighting with my uh, mouse pointer, the four segments of the video interviews, background, process, outcome, and future. So in each of these, we ask um, the party to the case a series of questions um, and then play them for the students. So I'll just show you quickly. Uh, so if we click on background here, And to a text of the questions we asked him, uh, we allow the applicant to, or the party to respond, we place the transcripts as you will see. And so I started, well, so the case started sometime in 2004, and at the time I was 19, 20 years old. Yes, okay, so I'm going to pause this. But as you can see, uh, this one lasts about nine minutes. The, the, the timing kind of varies depending on, upon how, how verbose the, the parties were. But in each of the five micro modules, we see these four segments, back, uh, background process, outcome, and future. So again, let me click on um, outcome uh, just to show you what it looks like. Let me skip forward a bit. All right, so here was one of the questions we asked. Uh, yes, I did read it. Um... It was long. <laughs> I can't say I don't know fully what it was, what it was everything that you had. Right, so that's the idea of, of how these um, all work. So if you read the final report, you see that the students uh, responded well to these um, micro modules. Again, the combination of the textual description of the legal principles, the links to the relevant law, whether it's legislation or other cases, uh, the media links. But again, most importantly, the core of the micro module is this video interview with the actual person um, that was involved talking about what their experience was like going through the uh, system. All right, so again, that sort of summarized what the students would would see um, on the on the Blackboard course um, website. So how did this work in practice? So our original plan, um, as I said, was uh, that, that I teach uh, typically the JD version of the constitutional law course um, in CUHK and uh, Rehan teaches the LLB version. And, and our plan was, well, let's develop these modules and we'll use them um, in both when we teach the equality rights segment of the courses. Now, as it turned out, the year that we did this project, I ended up being assigned to teach only um, essentially the first half of um, the JD version of, of the course and a third faculty member unconnected to this project um, taught the actual lectures um, on equality rights, including LGBT rights. Um, and so this ended up surprisingly being actually a useful way for us to see um, or to think about the use of micromodules from a pedagogical perspective, because of course, um, that teacher didn't rely on these uh, modules in the same way that Rehan did, because they, as I said, they were not involved in, in the project. So they graciously agreed to, to provide access to them, but they didn't rely upon them in their day-to-day um, -day lecturing. And of course, we didn't ask them to, to either. So in the JD course then, um, essentially the micro modules were just made available to the students um, as a resource, right? So they had the link to that Blackboard website, but um, the professor that was teaching the equality rights segment of the course uh, taught it as, as she wished to, to teach it. Um, in the LLB version of the course, right? So delivered by the co-supervisor, by Rehan, um, they were much more, the micro modules were much more deeply integrated into his um, lesson plans. 
Um, they were relied upon um, directly in his tutorials. And so students were really required um, in his class to reflect um, not only upon the legal principles that, that underpin um, kind of the evolution of LGBT rights in Hong Kong, but also about um, the subjective experiences um, that the parties had undergone as reflected in, in the interviews, right? And then they were asked about that and they were encouraged to think about, you know, what does this mean for, what does this tell us about um, judicial review in Hong Kong? What does this tell us about the legal system, access to justice, um, and, and so on. And so I think seeing these, uh, these two different ways of using the modules um, ends up being really important to students. And the response rates we received um, to anonymous questionnaires at the end of the courses um, I think really shows you uh, that this distinction um, does, does matter. So this is what the um, survey asked, the online survey. So a series of 10, 10 questions. I'm not going to read these online. You can get the gist of, of what they're about. But students were asked at the end of the course, you know, do you strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, etc. for each of these um, 10 statements. So the JD course um, has over three sections, is a much larger course than the LLB version of the course. It has about 200 students, but only four students completed the survey, right? And again, I think this is because the micro modules were not um, connected into, into the, the, the delivery of the course in a, in a deep way. They were just sort of there as a resource and nothing more. In the LLB course, in contrast, a much smaller course, only 75 students roughly, um, as you can see, nearly half or more than half um, completed the survey. Now, in both cases, um, the results were extremely positive, right? So you can see for the eighth statement from the previous screen, let me go back, previous screen statement eight, overall, the micro modules enhanced my understanding of LGBT rights um, in Hong Kong. Okay, so in the JD version of the course, all four students who responded to the survey uh, strongly agreed with that statement. In the LLB version of the course, 21 strongly agreed and 18 agreed, right? There was nobody that kind of disagreed with this statement. So in, in both cases, right, the results are very positive, but I think you can just see by these numbers, um, the decision of only four people to participate in the survey suggests to me, at least, that probably most students in the, in the JD didn't even access um, the, the modules, right? Because they were, as they were, as I said, they were placed just as an available resource rather than being central to the teaching style. So tentative conclusions we have, well, we conclude that there is a gap in the way that the law is taught, or at least an opportunity to teach it in a slightly different way. We think that there is real benefit to um, connecting the law to real people, um, to, in, to not only engage students with um, the substantive elements of the law, much of which they can get from the traditional way of, of reading. But I think this um, helps their ability to empathize with parties, perhaps to see bigger picture or to ask bigger picture questions about the way in which the legal system is run, to think about access to justice, right? So to sort of think about the law as more than just a series of legal principles. And I think particularly in, in an undergraduate course, this is really important and is one of the things that um, the university tries to inculcate in students. At the same time, as I've said, the tentative con conclusion from a pedagogical perspective is that micro modules to be effective really do seem to be, you do seem to need to deeply integrate them into the in-classroom um, curriculum. So, you know, again, just, just making them available as an additional resource probably means they'll be treated just as readings are treated by some, some students, right? So some students might do them, we might all hope that they do all of them, but realistically, many students won't do the readings. And I think realistically, even for watching videos, um, this suggests that realistically, many students won't do that unless they see a need to it, right? That there's some particular reason for them to do it because they're going to be asked a question in the classroom or because it's going to directly feature on an exam. Um, in some way. So those are our tentative conclusions about, about this project. Um, more broadly, we, we, we are of the view that this style of, of micromodule is useful. It could be expanded um, to a range of different um, cases. It doesn't have to be limited to equality rights. It certainly doesn't have to be limited to, to constitutional law, um, things like criminal law, tort law, you know, where the parties matter in some way, that the parties are at the heart of the of the case, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity here to build resources because once you have these videos, once you make them, then they're there, right? You you know you can just have a, a batch of, of 10 or 15 cases for each course that students can rely upon 
Um, and I think that would be a useful a useful thing. Anyway, uh, that's all I have for here. Again, my apologies uh, for not being able to present this to you live and in person. But of course, um, if you do have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them um, via email. Um, you can find my email address on the first slide of this presentation. And also you can just find me on the faculty website as well. So um, that's all from me. Um, please enjoy the rest of, of the conference um, and best wishes. Bye bye. Can, um, can I just share with you a comment from Jossica, Jessica Kutin from the Victoria Law Foundation. Jessica says, just a comment, an amazing project, interviewing the people involved in the case, brings the case alive for students. So thank, thanks. I mean, it would be nice to, to, I think there's plenty we could comment on, but we, we're kind of coming to the end. And I do think though as well, there's a kind of authenticity in it. So it ties in with Sadie's theme at the beginning. But I think the time has now come for us to move to the concluding session. Thank you.